Good evening, everybody. I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, David Arendelle. He is an associate professor in the Department of Post-Secondary Teaching and Learning at the University of Minnesota and co-director of the Janus Center. Uh, he investigates the history and the best practices of college access, developmental education, and then academic intervention supporting students' achievement and persistence. At the University of Missouri, Kansas City, Dr. Arendelle was National Project Director of Supplementary Instructor. He served as the President of the National Association of Developmental Education, um, the Council of Learning Assistance and Developmental Education Associations in, inducted him as a, as a founding fellow of, of the profession. Recently, he uh, published Access at the crossword, uh, Crossroads, Learning Assistance in Higher Education. Please, let's welcome uh, Dr. Aaron Dale. Well, what a great privilege to be with you all today. Thank you for all joining. I look forward to this being a interactive time for us. There'll be, as you'll see here in a moment, we're going to have uh, opportunities for you to talk. Um, either vocally or through the text chat room that you see in the lower uh, left hand corner. Uh, and also I can activate microphones. In fact, I saw a note there from uh, Eva or Eva. Uh, she was saying about she was connected but not mic'd. Um, if you like, I can go ahead and connect up so that you can actually uh, participate by uh, voice. Um, it's the system is um, defaulted not to turn that on unless um, you want it on then. So uh, you just simply post up a chat note whenever you'd like to be able to say something and I'll be happy to get your mic turned on then. Well, let's kind of take a look at some of the learning objectives up here and then what we'll do is that we'll end up taking a look um, at uh, a couple of housekeeping things on how to be able to get the most out of this. Well, uh, I guess I must be kind of a typical teacher. I have about a million PowerPoint slides. I have everything I'd love to do. I think I've lined out the entire fall set of workshop series for you, and we're going to try to do sample a number of these all throughout the day. Um, this agenda was put together along with uh, collaboration with Tim Self who suggested what would be some of the more helpful activities that would be useful for you for us to talk about, to explore. Please realize that I understand that you already have a great program. I'm hoping by the time we get to the end of today you have found two new ideas that would be worthy for you to explore and I need frankly to learn much more about your institution as well. So let's just kind of look at some of these. I try to make a point not to read PowerPoint slides uh, to people, but you kind of see all the kind of different topics that we're taking a look at here. I'm extremely sensitive to the issue that this is uh, for academic advisors and counselors and faculty members who teach developmental level courses as well as faculty members like me who teach uh, courses at the um, college graduation credit level but I infuse those with best practices of developmental education. So hopefully we're going to be able to um, uh, reach many of us today with some practical solutions. Let me go ahead and flip over to here just a few housekeeping items here about the, uh, about the workshop. Um, microphones can be activated for all the remote locations and uh, currently I've got the one um, enabled for there at Austin at the campus. Uh, they have to press a button I believe in order to be able to have the microphone engaged but it is hot and available. We're going to be mostly using probably PowerPoint slides as kind of a backup, but also uh, we have opportunities for not only using this little chat room down here in the lower uh, left-hand corner, but also I have another room that we can go to, so don't get seasick. There we go. And then this one, it kind of has some of the similar features that we had in the other one, except the chat room is bigger. So. Um, you can end up seeing here's all of our conversation. In fact, what I'll do here is I'll just go ahead and clear out all of this chat for the moment and we can start up again. Um, let's see. Oh, um, I was looking for a little gizmo. You notice there along the right hand side you end up seeing that there's something that's called file share. There are um, files that you can download to your own computer. 
And the files that I have up there is the a handout of all the PowerPoint slides. That's the top one up there, DE Overview. And then I've got a couple other handouts I may end up referring to, uh, particularly the PASSIT books, which is our way of looking at universal instructional design. So that may be something that you want to uh, take advantage of then and download uh, before the uh, session's over with. You also end up seeing web links down here. This actually allows you to be able to press on any of those web links and it will open up a separate window in order to be able to look at that. And I'll probably suggest we take a peek at some of those as we're moving forward. And also down here in the note box you end up seeing the um, uh, the actual link to get into this particular um, session. So in case you brought your laptop with you to the big room, you can go ahead and uh, type, um, go ahead and access that directly. So let's do our first interaction up here. Let's find out who's up here. And that is, I just opened up a poll up there in the upper right-hand corner. What's your primary job responsibility? I realize you may be in a site with a whole bunch of people, but let's just kind of see who all's here at the moment. So we've got live here. It looks like we've got three counselors. I'll press in one for me. I teach uh, college level courses. And I realize there may be many more people inside of some of the uh, rooms. So looks like we've got a, a um, sample here among the three groups that we thought were going to be here. And for all we know, there we are. We've got someone who's probably also academic advising and maybe teaching. That's the same thing is true for me. Okay. So we've got kind of an idea about who we are here. We've got the diversity that we are hoping for, so that's good news. I want to take you over to the other window that we might use on occasion. So once again, kind of moves around. And this one up here allows me to kind of have a blackboard to work on. I regret it doesn't give us the permission for you guys to be able to type onto it. I was kind of hoping for that, but uh, it didn't quite work out. So at this point, I'm going to uh, head back over to the beginning. There we go. Now we're back up to where we are at. Well, the first thing I want to do rather quickly was Tim asked, he said, well, kind of what's going on with developmental education and learning assistance nationally? Because I think that the model that you practice inside of Texas is very different. No, that's not some sort of humorous joke. Uh, it is that you are very different in terms of your embracement and financial and personnel support for developmental education. It's no big surprise that the first two uh, graduate PhD programs or EDD programs in developmental education are in Texas, not in other states, because you really understand this differently and you see the obvious tie between developmental education and developmental courses and access, getting to college, and also, as I thought I read some statistic, you need another half a million people in the workforce within the next few years, something like that. So you see that linkage. Tragically, that linkage is not occurring inside of many other states. So here's what I think are current trends, and we're going to move pretty quickly here. Uh, I just want to quickly give you somewhat of an overview of what I see going on. The first one is really hot, and that is the elimination of DE courses at more and more colleges. Uh, some of you may be, uh, participate in the Learn Assist uh, email listserv of people who are in the field of developmental education or learning assistance and Ohio just grew just joined a group of other states who are eliminating all DE courses at the four-year level uh, the reason for that is that our community college friends can do a much better job Agreed. My first 10 years were working at community colleges. I started in a community college of only 500 students 500. You guys have a campus, uh, Tim tells me, of 45,000 students. Very small community college, but I thought we did really good work, and we offer developmental level courses. So I, I feel good about knowing that other places think that we're a great place, but I'm really concerned because of the second point, which is that uh, two-year colleges are taking more of the workload, and oftentimes they're not getting any additional state financial help, and I think that's part of the sad part. DE courses, um, this is something Hunter Boylan has been reporting on, that you're going to have to have three levels or less of developmental courses, kind of like, I guess it would be in math sequence, it would be what, elementary math, uh, excuse me, elementary algebra, intermediate algebra, 
and I guess maybe one other one's maybe fundamentals of mathematics, but you're not going to be able to offer deeper levels. There are some campuses across the U.S. that had seven levels of developmental level courses. In fact, some of them probably would actually be better um, labeled as remedial level courses. Well, across the United States, they're just simply saying that if you have that many levels that you need for development, you really need to be someplace else. The fourth item is no big surprise about it. it seems like economics seems to drive everything, and um, frankly, I think that pretty much explains whenever they try to explain a philosophical reason for making a change. I think it's really about all the economics. I'm really concerned about there's fewer professionals that are conducting research on developmental education because you don't have developmental ed courses oftentimes being taught at research universities where faculty like me are required and quite privileged by the way to need to do research and to write and to disseminate information. At the community college level, you're hip deep in students. I used to be there. I used to teach five credit. I used to teach five courses a semester with large course loads. So I don't have time to be able to do the extensive research. I really, my hat is off to anybody who's able to keep up a research agenda, be able to publish, and also be able to teach five classes with a growing number of students and also a growing diversity of the students within those rooms. But I'm really worried that we're beginning to get to the point to where some of the good research isn't happening anymore. And frankly, I sit on the uh, editorial boards for a couple of journals. They so want more submissions to come in. I think that the quality of the research that is published inside of, let's say, the Journal of, of JCRL, uh, Journal of College Reading and Learning, or JDE, Journal of Developmental Education, or any of the other ones are quite good but I'd much rather see more manuscripts getting turned in. I think another issue that's going on is that voluntary uh, drop-in programs are not as um, successful and more colleges are beginning to say that there needs to be mandatory participation. That's the reason why, you know, I used to work with supplemental instruction, as some of you may be familiar. And, you know, our hallmark was it's totally voluntary, it's totally anonymous, but we're finding out now that Many times the students who most need to go to SI sessions don't go. In fact, um, less than a third of those students who are predicted to have a lot of academic challenges even go once a semester. There's nothing wrong with SI. It's wonderful in terms of where it works best. But there's, I think, a growing trend. And that's the reason why you see some other um, similar kinds of things to SI, like peer-led team learning. That's a big program that oftentimes is attached to historically difficult uh, introductory college uh, chemistry courses. It's a mandatory thing. They simply have bundled in their version of an SI session as part of the course session. So that's an example of that. Or in mentoring sessions. Uh, a variation that I hear within some TRIO programs is that, well, 10 out of the 15 weeks, you have to go in and go in for small group or individualized tutoring. You've got a choice for five weeks out of the semester not to go, but most of the time you have to go. And what the research has tended to show is that if you end up going and you have a positive experience, you don't go just 10 times for the semester. You actually end up going about 13 or 14 or maybe 15 times then. So those are some of the uh, current trends I think that's going on. Um, this is kind of my little uh, comment about voluntary programs. It used to be that we thought that if we had great buildings and services, they'd always show up. And what we understand from the research is that sometimes the students who most avail themselves of the services are those who uh, probably would have already had high grades to begin with. So I think that moving to more embedded programs is really important. Some other things that are going on, well, we continue to blame the K-12 education. Uh, stigma still is some influence. I mean, as much as we positively position our courses and our tutoring programs and the rest, there still is some stigma. And we've done a lot of research about that here at our institution because we used to be general college. Uh, General College was the largest public portal system inside of any uh, research university for being an access point for bringing in students who were predicted maybe not to do well, but actually to flourish whenever they were with us and taking our courses, receiving the intrusive academic advising and all the rest. But for all the wonderful stuff that we did and the success they enjoyed, they still spoke about the stigma. 
and about how they didn't like to discuss their involvement with other people. And I think that perhaps you've been able to solve that issue better in Texas. I hope that you write about that and explain how you've done so. We had a lot of difficulty with that with me and my colleagues and people at other institutions. Um, I think that, um, you know, once again, lots of research universities in four years talk about access and such. But frankly, you know, the economic trends means that there's going to be a lot of students who aren't going to be able to attend four-year schools. Mission differentiation, that's code language for a four-year institution doesn't want to do what it used to do. Uh, part of it is for economic reasons. I appreciate that. Some of it may be, well, maybe we've got a, another institution within 20 miles of us, so why should we have a program in the exact same area? But what I find, and if you end up looking at the literature, is that oftentimes mission differentiation is an excuse given by institutions to get rid of students who they really don't want or programs they prefer didn't exist. And that tends to include students who need access education. The irony about all of this is, and I do uh, research on the history of developmental education, every single institution in America, public or private, since the 1700s has been offering some sort of academic assistance, tutoring programs. The very first institution that ever offered a developmental level course was Harvard University. Now, it may be that the students who are placed into the Harvard uh, courses for developing their reading or their math or their writing skills might have been gifted at my institution, but Harvard understood that some students were all on these developmental pathways and they need uh, more assistance in development. Um, I think that Texas has done a great job with uh, certification and training programs and following national standards. Uh, you're a home of TIDE, the Texas Institute for, um, excuse me, the Technology Institute for Developmental Education. Excuse me, that's at uh, Texas State University San Marcos. So you do that. You're obviously the home for many of the great standards programs. And um, God bless Gladys Shaw, who recently passed. I mean, I can't think of someone who's more influential in the field of tutoring and tutoring certification and tutoring standards for improved quality of tutoring programs. I can't imagine any more than that. What a gracious lady. And she will, of course, be missed by all of us. In terms of uh, questions that I'm kind of frustrated about with this whole issue about dumping developmental level courses at a four-year institution, I got really mad about this and uh, posted up some blog postings. Maybe some of you saw that on the Learn Assist, but also I posted them elsewhere. And with all of this talk about removing developmental courses and saying that it's so much better to do that at the two-year institutions, which I have no doubt that you do a great job, but no one ever asked the question, well, why can't the four-year school do it? Why can't they do their job? Who has more economic resources? You know, why don't we hold them to the same standards? It seems like four-year schools can't exceed your expectation levels for success. And you kind of see me go on and on from there. Um, you know, and also it's that last point down there that was a little disturbing, I thought, in the Learn Assist uh, discussions was a couple of people from community colleges said, this is great, we do a great job. And I didn't get on to the listserv and dispute them, uh, but it's like, don't let the four-year schools off the hook. I agree, probably the best place, the most inexpensive place to do this is probably at your institution. But what are we going to do if you've got a four-year school located out in the middle of the Kansas prairies and there isn't a community college around and now there is no four-year, excuse me, there is no developmental level courses at that um, institution out in the prairie, then what do you do? And that's whenever I get really concerned about other questions like this, particularly whatever happened to choice in America. You know, I just am really quite concerned. How about the issue about, you know, land-grant institutions? It's federal law that you have to serve every single student who is a resident of the state. I have yet to hear a plausible excuse for that other than, well, there's more schools around. Okay, let's go move on. I've been ranting and raving, but I was given permission to say a little bit about trends. Other things I think that are upcoming trends is that there's going to be more of a need for uh, local colleges to have alliances with their local GED centers because students who have severe academic preparation issues, well, it's because of point number two, 
is that and I've already seen this uh, already being discussed for the community colleges located in California of putting in admission requirements. Part of the problem in California is that they literally don't have enough money in order to be able to pay. And now they're starting to use the excuse of, well, if you're not prepared enough and we can only admit so many students, maybe you should go off to a GED center somewhere. And that really concerns me a lot. Uh, at one of my community colleges, I was also the GED director. So it's not as though I'm giving any slight to GED. I think they're wonderful programs. Frankly, I think in a lot of ways they did much better than um, probably some other programs that are out there operating at colleges. But what I understand, though, is that maybe this is the time for us to start experimenting with them. And for all I know, maybe you already do that. Oh. I'm slave. Um, I'll make sure to um, deal with that. Thanks for giving me that heads up. Let me see voice options. I'm going to go ahead and put myself on high volume, and then you let me know if that's gone too high. So let's keep moving forward here. Uh, upcoming trends, I think that putting developmental education-like activities inside of courses is a big uh, trend. Also, I think that, and you're going to see this is a major component today, the way you do that is through universal learning design. They have different phrases that are out there. Maybe you're more familiar with universal instructional design. I chose to use learning design because you as academic advisors and counselors, you probably don't think of yourself as being instructors. Maybe you do. But I tend to think of the more universal term is learning design. I won't go into all the nuances of what the difference is between ULD, UID, and there's other variations of the letters. I honor all of that um, scholarship. Uh, Jean Higby, who is the senior member here in our department, and um, probably many of you are familiar with her work. There's also some of her books are available for downloading uh, through that web link. We'll go over to that site here in a little bit. Um, she explains uh, clearly the theoretical underpinnings for each of those theories, how they are similar, how they are different. Today, I'm going to be much more of a practitioner focus. Here's a dream. This isn't a trend. And this is probably my one little philosophical thing that I would like to do, and then we'll get into the rest. And I, But I think that this has some applicability, and that is that I don't think there's anything such thing as a developmental ed student. Or everybody is a developmental student. Let me just quickly read this. Actually, there's no such thing as developmental student exists. Rather, it's more accurate to say that some students are not academically prepared for college-level work in one or more academic content areas, the three of them there, or in other things like reading and study strategies. The relative need and usefulness of learning assistance for an individual student depends on the academic rigor of an institution, the subject matter studied, or even how one faculty member teaches a course compared with another in the exact same academic department. Therefore, the same individual could be a major consumer of learning assistance at one place, not at another, or even within the same academic department. The need for learning assistance is not a characteristic or universal defining attribute of a student. It depends on the conditions and expectations of the learning environment in a particular class. All college students are in a continuum between novice and master learner. Learning assistance serves students located along this continuum through a wide range of activities and services. The same student is often located at different places on the multiple continuum lines simultaneously. One continuum line for each academic context or skill. You know, why am I so fussy about the words? Well, it took me about six years to write this book. And I really believe in that. You know, and here's my next point up here. Do you declare a student who enrolls in a single poetry class a poet? I guess I should make this audience participation. Well, I don't think so. So why is it if a student takes a single DE course, suddenly they are, are declared for the rest of their lives to be developmental? And as it says down there, is it more accurate to say that any learner, regardless of age, is a developmental student? Well, I think that's what all of the educational um, leaders would say, but we just don't have the ability to say that publicly, and that's really too bad. Well, 
let's get into some more practical things. What do we already know about student success? Well, we know that we've got to front load services and put the very best programs up front. Don't wait till later on. So that's no big surprise. It's the reason why orientation programs, bridge programs, uh, SI programs, and initial um, uh, courses, intrusive academic advising, students in with counseling programs is so important at the front. A staying environment, you know, it's both the responsibility of the academic side of the, power, of the world as well as the social or the psychological. And of course, you as advisors and counselors know about all of those issues there. Can we save everybody who comes into the institution? No, it's not really possible. There's some people for which they're just not going to be prepared. They're what they call an involuntary undesirable. They just simply aren't prepared and they're not able, no matter what we do and offer for them, it's just not going to work out. Some people are voluntary desirable. They complete their objective. When I was out at Pratt Community College, students would take three classes and then leave and that was all they wanted but they show up in the system as being a failure and sometimes I think that the data management systems plant a play and portray a much more grim uh, outcome for higher ed than really is true. Some students leave because they are uh, academically frustrated and I think that's where lots of the academic support programs I think maybe for you as an advisor and a counselor that we don't want them to leave they're leaving on their own but it's undesirable because there's an intervention that could happen and then there's the involuntary desirable that's a pretty small number these are people who just simply can't function within the institution because of very serious psychological or, or personal issues and we obviously know that on what is the percentage now of students who bring a um, uh, invisible uh, disability with them to school. I was trying to remember uh, here the statistics that we talk about at Minnesota is that here at our university we estimate that at any given time 27 percent of our students could be uh, defined as being uh, classically uh, depressed. Um, the number of suicides at this institution. I mean, we're a campus of 50,000 or so. I remember going to one of the orientation sessions, and it's about 10 to 12 per year, and that's just the completed suicides. Now, is that surprising for a place of 50,000? Probably not, but the loss of any human soul is more than any of us want to think about. We already probably have already studied Tinto's themes up here of attrition, but no one really has really come up with anything that says anything different from them. They've tweaked his uh, themes up here, but those really haven't changed much. I just want to dwell on this slide for a moment, then we're going to be hitting some more content here, and that is, who is it that needs to change? It used to be it was about students have deficits, and we need to have them change. I think all the newer models is that it's about the institution. It's about the learning culture. Hmm. Sound, sound is, is really distorted. distorted. Okay, okay. Let me, Let me uh, adjust, adjust the microphone, the microphone again. again. Thank, Thank you for giving me the feedback there. there. Let's go, Let's back, go back to, to medium, 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 volume, volume. Um, and, and let's see let's what, see what happens with this. Please so keep, so keep me up on this. Keep working. I'm working. I'm not moving. Not moving. moving. So, so let's keep let's moving. Keep moving. Thank you. Thank you. So what are so some, what are some different, different groups, 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 some of the some behaviors, behaviors that we need to be concerned, concerned about? We have some, we have some uh, echo in Austin. Austin. You know what, you know what if I go and go turn off, off Austin, Austin here for a moment, uh, your, your microphone, microphone, and, and see, see if, if that, that does, does anything. anything. And let's see and if, let's if there's see anything else that I need to turn off. I'm going to turn down my speakers. Okay, how's that sounding for you, Connie? Does that sound any better at this point? Oops, let me go back to here. Still distorted. No, still static. Okay, let's do a little bit of problem solving here for a moment. Um, better now. I know one of the things that happens is there is a lag of about 10 seconds. Okay. Well, let me go and turn my speakers off here, and we'll just keep um, checking the feedback then. Thank you very much. Uh, what are some of the different student groups? 
Well, one of the things we know is that it seems like a lot of attention at most institutions are for the high-risk students and the honor students, and sometimes the average students get left out. Obviously, for you as counselors and advisors, you've moved beyond just simply about course uh, recording and planning, but you're looking much more deeply with them. You know, are they intrinsic or extrinsic in terms of their goals? Is it because it's something that they want, or is it because of other people on the outside that they want? And in terms of performance, are they avoiding things because they have concern about the way that they appear, particularly in front of their peers, or are they using an approach performance? In terms of what are some of the big issues, well, it's I think one of the big conundrums is low achievement, but they feel good about themselves, this high self-esteem. It's part of the reason why we're so concerned about special programs for students because Claude Steele and others have always pointed out that that's negative stereotyping. Gather up a group of students who probably would have done just well, say we've got a special program for you because research shows that you're at a high risk of dropping out and as Steele's research showed, well then all of a sudden you start thinking about failure and you start getting worried and then you're more apt according to the research to drop out. I think that recognizing that there is no such thing as a neutral uh, learning environment. One of our colleagues here, she's published widely on the issue of white learning space. And I think that that's something that obviously you're very sensitive to because Texas is much more culturally diverse than we are. Um, if any of you are familiar with um, John Nesbitt, um, some of you are old enough maybe to remember the book Megatrends, and he said there's really five states that you need to look at, California, Texas, Florida, um, Colorado, uh, interestingly, and I think it was like Connecticut or Vermont. And the argument was that things that happen inside of those states tend to emanate throughout the rest of the U.S. Not quite sure why Colorado is one of the uh, leading indicators. Um, because I don't tend to think of it in the same way, but I deferred to Dr. Nesbitt. So obviously that's an issue that you're most concerned about. I think that um, we all have a variety of people out there that are trying to talk to us. Why do students do or they don't? Uh, Myron Dimbo from USC, I highly recommend his work. He's a cognitive psychologist, and it makes sense on, he says that he kind of classifies students into these categories. Of they can't change, they don't want to change, they don't know how to change, they don't know what to change. And part of what he argues is that until students finally can understand why it is that the change is not occurring, then really there isn't very much impact that you can have. And I thought that he has some really good um, uh, literature that we ought to look at and I think that thinking of things you know it's a whole issue about metacognition you know I think obviously you're the home for Claire Weinstein I don't think there's anybody who's probably better known in our field for really helping us to understand if we don't get students to think about their thinking if we don't get them practical models that they can adopt then students aren't going to be making behavioral changes so uh, hats off to uh, Dr. Weinstein. That's been my privilege to have some personal conversations with her, and she's been very influential in my thoughts on how to make changes. Quickly, just kind of looking at some of the student populations that we're working with, you know, these are things that you already know. You know, for the first year students, it's about helping them to kind of identify for their identity, but also helping them to have a purpose. Without purpose, people are going to tend to drop out. I think about Chip Anderson, who recently passed away, I think, within the last five years. It was his concept of force field analysis, that you have enormous forces that are pushing you out of the institution, financial. Uh, it could be about being first generation and unfamiliarity with the culture. It may be peer groups. It may be families that are trying to push you out. On the other hand, you have things that are pushing you in and keeping you in the institution and his argument would be these kinds of items up here if you're having academic success if you have positive relationships and the rest of these then these are the forces that help keep you in school and not dropping out in terms of the underprepared students well for them it's this idea of them feeling like that they have some control I work with uh, students in my own class in terms of we just gave the first major examination 
And students came in to see me because some of them got D's and F's. We have a whole bunch, and we're going to give an illustration coming up here pretty soon. Now, what are some of the strategies that I've built into my class in order to be able to help them be more successful? I'm trying to embed best practices, developmental education inside. And whenever they come in, we talk about what behaviorally did they do uh, before the exam and how they behaved on the exam. And one of my major goals is getting them to understand, using a concept from the uh, Becoming a Master Student book, one of the power processes is uh, you create it all, and that you're responsible. You earn your A and you earn your F. And I find that many students like to think that school is like a lottery, that you uh, buy a ticket and then maybe you get an A or maybe you get a D, but really it's all a matter of luck. And as you kind of notice up here, part of it is it really is psychological. And I think about that's part of what you're doing as an advisor and a counselor and frankly as a faculty member is dealing with the emotional side. And frankly, I really have come to that conclusion. I should have done that 30 years ago. But I think about how when I walk into class, I, number one, I always kind of meditate in my office, not TM-like, but just kind of get quiet, turn the lights out for about 15 minutes before I go in um, to go teach. And part of it, I'm just trying to quiet my spirit, be in a good place, and then go in and make sure that I'm attuned to not only what the students are saying, but also what I'm feeling. And I'm just so not that. Talk to any of my ex-girlfriends. Um, you know, they'd be shocked that I suddenly have become much more emotionally attuned. Actually, I was kind of trained by my last ex. She was a good woman. Um, but it was this whole issue about making connections with your students and understanding that I have the power to emotionally destroy them. And I don't think I ever really understood that. I, I don't do that, just to make sure you know that. But I really have, in the last five years, decided one of my top three roles when I go into the class is to be an encourager. Boy, they never taught me that when I was going through grad school as a historian. It was all about content and effectiveness of presentation of content. But never was very much attention about people. And I'm very sad to say it took me a number of years to kind of understand that. Well, it's an enormously complex issue about talking about students of color. We're not going to read all the way through the slide here. But I think this whole issue about being sensitive, that there is no such thing as a neutral environment. I have a colleague here at the university. Uh, he is a scientist. I won't say anything else to self-identify him. And we were having quite a discussion about multiculturalism and cultural issues and sensitivity to identity. And the reply from the uh, faculty member was, well, I teach facts. I teach science. There is no culture in science. Is anyone shocked about that? You're more than welcome to put in anything on the chat room on that. I, I'm not exactly the most sensitive person on the planet, but even I understand there is no such thing as a neutral environment. And I have uh, read uh, some major books talking about how chilly the environment is for people of color and females in many of the occupations within science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And so this whole issue up here about the sensitivity about the culture, um, and understanding what it is that we as an institutional culture need to shift to is really powerful. Additional ones up here talking about how we need to change our pedagogy inside the class in order to meet their needs. Not that we have to change, but simply to make a more conducive learning environment. Probably one of the best things that I do is a lesson I learned from another colleague of mine is that I have a 10 minute interview with every student in my class. I have 150 of them, so I'm no saint. But I find that it is so effective for me to make the connection with the students. Many of them say they've never talked to a professor personally before. They've never gone to a faculty member's office. And also, no one's ever listened to them about what would make the class even better. So I won't go through all the different things that they've been telling me. But i got to tell you, it's probably one of the most powerful changes for my curriculum is on the basis of what they've done. One of the things that we use is something that's called Map It. And I didn't have a link to this uh, for some reason um, placed up yet. I'll try to place that up before um, we finish up for today. But if you just simply Google Map It, make sure you do Map and then the hyphen IT and then put um, Cerdul, C-R-D-E-U-L. 
then you'll get to an online version of this. This is a instrument to take the cultural climate of an institution and it's customized for these four different groups up here and it isn't like you're going to add up a score and come up with a numerical value but it'll create an incredible amount of conversation data for people to talk about as it says there creating a real change among the campus culture so sometimes we kind of zoom by things quickly here I don't I want to make sure to give honor to this frankly I think that the instrument has been underused um, you know we created it we did some good work with it and then some of us have moved on to some other things but I highly recommend someone at least taking a look at that what is it it takes to retain the average students? Well, this is the last point down there, and I know you already are doing this, but Noel Levitz, the student retention firm, talks about this all the time, that our institutions creating programs that systematically deal with all the students on campus. Students in terms of those with a disability, we're going to be talking about that coming up. And that helps to drive part of the reason why we're so interested in universal instructional design or universal learning design, whichever you want to use. Because what we operate on is that the modifications we make inside of a classroom from an individual student, if we would just take the next step and extend that for everybody inside the class, it actually per increases success for everybody. Well, here's our first scenario. So it gives a chance for you guys to do some talking and also to do some work on the uh, chat room. So we're going to stop here. Scenario, a historically difficult course. Lecture note taking is difficult for most of the people. A note taker is now in the class helping one student with a disability. Other students want help too. Student Senate poses demands for more campus academic help. I want you to take about two minutes or so at your group, and I realize some of you are by yourself, but I want you to think, what would you do about that? How could we take the resources and time and effort for this one, how could we do something that helped everyone? So please stop for a moment and discuss this amongst yourself, and then let's come back and either uh, use the microphone, send me a message, or let's do some chatting. And what I'll do is that I'll shift over to the other screen uh, but I'll let you kind of see the question a little bit more and I'll quit talking and then I'll shift to the other screen and let's get some interaction. If anyone needs me to shift back, just put a message in the chat room. But I want to go ahead. I'm going to go down here and clean out that and see what you've got to say. Here we go. I'll turn you on as well. Um, oh, oh, that's what I wanted. Just a second. Let me catch back up with you here. Yeah, I'm sorry about that, um, Eva. Um, I 
there's a button that I need to push. And I apologize to the HBC campus. I must not be pushing a button correctly because um, we're not getting any audio. I've made a mistake. So I'm afraid you'll have to type your response. My apology to everyone. Like I said, we're not able to hear you in Austin, so could you type some of your response for us? There we go. I'm afraid that um, at least I missed the beginning part. Could you try that again? What the group was saying is that the classroom instruction should be, it should have a very, uh, variety of um, teaching styles, like uh, visual, uh, more interactive, uh, more experiential type of learning. Uh, Okay. I missed the the female voice at the very end. Well, in, in this scenario, it was stating that most are finding it difficult, so then that made us feel that that's ah. an issue for the majority of the class. Yes. So therefore, we were stating that um, if, if the learning could be a little bit more interactive hmm. and maybe taking a different approach, um, the instructor taking a different approach in his teaching methods and style. Wow. You actually gave an answer I haven't heard on doing this uh, scenario before, and actually it is really quite humbling because you're right. There's a systemic issue going on inside the class. Now, once again, we don't know all the information because it's an imaginary scenario, um, but you really kind of hit the issue there. Now, looking at Eva's or Eva's uh, comment, it was access to the notes could be made available to all the students on Blackboard. That's the more uh, typical response. That's what I would have thought of. But you actually kind of hit the nail on the head that there's really a bigger issue that's afoot. And that obviously takes an awful lot of sensitivity on how do you approach a faculty member with that. Maybe you start off by the, um, can we make the notes available on Blackboard for only for students who have, you know, password uh, permission to be able to look at it. And then maybe hopefully we have conversation with that faculty member if we've got a teaching learning center on campus they could avail of. Hmm. Very good. Any comments from any of the others of you? Another option, uh, if the instructor is willing to do this, um, to either have a counselor or a study sports instructor come in at the beginning of the class and hmm. begin the class or the course with some information on note-taking and some good practice, hmm. or if the instructor is willing to take that on hmm. and teach the students themselves, to hmm. it. it would also be, I think, enlightening for the instructor, which I think is, is significant. Nice. I I would even go so far as to say that um, college instructors don't get the same kind of um, instruction that K-12 teachers do as far as learning about effective learning strategies and um, different learning styles in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if in inviting a counselor or advising a classroom, um, 
doing a learning style assessment is not only eye-opening for the student, but the professor can do a great job in their classroom and adjust instruction accordingly as well. And I think a lot of college instructors come with a degree that allows them to teach in their subject area, but they don't know how to reach their students with that education in the most effective way. So I think it's learning from both ends. Thank you. One of the things I'm also trying to do is realize there's about a five to ten second lag between when we hear things and we speak. So um, sometimes there'll be some pauses before I respond, and then I'm just waiting in case we're not done yet. Um, I just want to affirm well the things that you just talked about. My own personal story is I was going to take some pedagogy courses while I was in grad school to become a history teacher. Asked my uh, department chair about that. I said, shouldn't I go over to that school of education maybe and take a couple classes on how to teach? And he looked at me rather sternly and said, no, you don't need anything from that building, but I have another graduate course that you probably could really um, find useful and they'll give you more information. So that was unfortunate. Excellent suggestions everyone has come up with. Thank you very much. Um, let's go back and take a look at a few more slides and we'll come back and do this again soon. Let the system reset. There we go. Um, about retaining undecided students. Well, that's the reason why we've got academic advisors and counselors. Uh, retaining honor students. I think that this actually was one that I was dealing with in my office the other day. I had a student who was crying. And this student had gotten straight A's in high school and got uh, received a uh, C- minus on the student's first examination. And the student was making comments about self, about some of these things up here. They were unfamiliar. They thought that somehow uh, they maybe didn't belong here at the university and we probably spent 30 minutes of just talking about some emotions and some of my perspective and then also I encouraged her to take advantage if she thought best for our counseling services on campus because on our campus you can have 12 free sessions before there is a very very modest charge for um, for doing so. Um, so once again, you know, I'm finding that the more I go along is the more that it turns out that it's about human emotions. I'm going to go through these really very quickly here because these are probably more applicable sometimes for learning centers, but at least these are inside of your handout if you choose to print that out then. These are all categories of best practices. I want to get us into um, um, universal learning design and talk about some very practical examples that could be applicable for advisors, counselors, and for faculty members. So with your permission, I'm going to probably reference most of this material. I just want to value it and then encourage you to take a look at it. Um, there's lots of places which have come up with categories of best practices. Probably the uh, best example of that would be Hunter Boylan's book that came out a few years ago in which he looked at uh, best practices. It was done in cooperation with several other hosting organizations that commissioned the National Center for Developmental Education to identify those. But these best practices up here have been listed by a number of research studies and surveys over the past 30 years. In terms of organizational administration, it seems that having things consolidated and centralized seems to be kind of a major issue. That somehow being an organized system rather than a decentralized system is pretty important. Once again, I realize there's too much detail up here to read on the screen, but if you look at it on your uh, handout, you'll notice I have the website located um, on any of these little case studies, and you might want to go and, and take a look at them up here. What they said, because I interviewed the director of all of these developmental education centers, or whatever they call themselves, they, it's an interesting field. We have 165 different terms used to describe developmental education. And part of it has to do with politics, part of it has to do with a unique uh, choice of a name at a particular institution. You know, it's kind of like you go across the United States, you don't have 
165 different terms for the math department. There might be some variations of the name, but you kind of will know what the math department is. But as you go across the United States, uh, sometimes it's a real fishing expedition to find the learning assistance or the development education unit. So I interviewed all these directors and this person said, well, the key thing is that it's really coordinated and centralized. And that's the reason why things go better. Exact same thing here at Penn State, large institution. Actually, it's smaller than your institution. But once again, it's all about they bring together all their services. Now, the applicability of this for our conversation today is how is uh, the Office of Disability Services on your campus uh, positioned in regard to the counseling center or advising services or the developmental education unit? Um, I did not check up on that. I should have done so, so I apologize. I should have learned more about your institution. But one of the things that Penn State said is that putting all these centers all close to each other means that students can easily find them, transition back and forth. People can be walked up and down the hallway in order to get from one office to the next. If it turns out another one might be a, a better resource. So at your campus, maybe someone could reply on the chat room in physical location. And this isn't a judging issue, it's just an observational issue, is the Disability Services Office geographically close to where the counseling center is at? I'll just wait for someone to respond on the chat room. Wow, outstanding. That's uh, not true. Please. I see the trend at the bottom. I'll reply real quick. Oh, okay. uh, they're co located with student services. Uh, pretty close to wherever the logistics allow for it. Mm -hmm. uh, they're located close to student services. Each campus of the many campuses that we have may be slightly different, mm -hmm. but they're most closely connected to student services. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. Um, on our campus, they're not. They're actually located probably half a mile from each other. That's not a good practice. Um, good people um, in both places, but um, that's one of the penalties for being a large geographic campus is that sometimes they don't put all the services together. And you talked about sometimes they have to go where the space is. Um, that might have been kind of true for where they put the Disability Services Office at, but it's at the far end of the campus in the same building as alumni relations. And I kind of don't understand what the relationship is between fundraising, alumni, and I'm not here to make fun of them. That's not the intent. But I mean, from a logical point of view, it doesn't make a bit of sense. Maybe they had to do that when some buildings were under construction or renovation, but for goodness sakes, they've been there now for nearly 10 years, and it just doesn't make any sense why they're not. You know, you think about in terms of what is your alliances that you're all working with with your programs. Many of these successful um, programs that have been identified, they all seem to have not only a physical proximity to one another, but also to what degree do they actually have an organizational uh, co-location together. And this is just simply something that I tend to find in the literature that all of these programs oftentimes operate out of the exact same administrative unit, if not exactly the same physical location. Uh, Bryant Lo University is a small institution, and for them, you can notice they host the Disability Services Unit. They also host the advising and mentoring of probationary students, and they're also the home of their first-year experience course. And I think about how it's not a surprise any that says down there, nearly every single student on campus uses one of its hosted services, and it helps to break down, for some people, the emotional barriers of walking in and picking up and going in and seeing a tutor. Uh, same kind of thing here uh, at Lee's McRae is that first year experience, disability services, they do the summer orientation for all new students as well as retention services are placed with them. Um, here's another example of a uh, simulation activity here. So let's take a look at this one. Um, and this one here, the director, uh, excuse me, the disability services officer seeks to share information about mainstreaming accommodations within the classroom. However, some faculty and staff are reluctant because they think that they're, you know, overworked, underpaid. 
been there, done that, and kind of that's what we think here, but you're not going to see me complain. I feel very privileged to work here, so no complaining by me. But the question is, is what does it take in order to get people dissatisfied with the current environment that they'll want to change? That maybe that's the most important question, is what is it going to take to get people to be open to change? You know, what is it that it takes? So let's take um, two minutes to talk about that inside of your group there at Austin and then for the others of our friends who are working by themselves. I'm going to go ahead and switch us back over to the larger uh, discussion chat area. What does it take in order to see change occur on campus? I think you might be related to the, uh, the fact that in this campus, the disability services inconvenient. I don't know. I, I don't know if it could be a lawsuit, but I just it's almost discriminatory in a way because you almost have to disclose if you all across the campus, you almost have to disclose that you have a disability. That some individual. I don't know where our campus is set up. It's newer campus, you really won't really know who's receiving the services or not. They're kind of the way they walk in, but I know at Riverside, where it's set up, you know. So what kind of change? David, be yes. specific about what kind of Oh, change. I'm sorry. I'm, well, I was, I was letting you open on this question. What would it take in order to get people on campus, faculty members, to say, I need to make some behavioral changes inside of my class to increase success of students? What would it take to get them to say, there's a big issue? Or what would it take in order to get people inside of student services, whether it be disability services, counseling, advising? What is the kind of event or data that would be necessary to cause people to want to not just do status quo? You mentioned the word lawsuit, and that, that's true. That can happen. Uh, what other kinds of things prompt change? Student voice, student governance. Can you put the microphone a little closer to you? Or speak up here. This past semester at our different campuses, we had what was called the Front Door Initiative, and it was through uh, Student Live. But really, it, it really got sort of um, a lot of brainstorming happening as far as like what does it take to make change occur on the campus. And we just sort of talked about how we could improve our customer service. And, and really, like what it kind of comes down to is a commitment by all and, and you know, sharing the same vision and sharing that commitment. And that may sound, you know, just pretty open in general. But really, that's kind of where it can start to, to have staff and faculty that are committed to students and who are very student centered, I think. So uh, sometimes I think it's a matter of uh, sort of being reminded um, that really we are here to serve. And um, that was just kind of like a starting point for us and what we talked about is having that commitment to serve um, students to the best of our ability. And whether that's through um, something as simple as when you have new students on your campus, and they're, you know, they're feeling a little lost, taking the time to walk them over to another office if that's where they need to go, and just really going that extra mile to provide that, that service to students. And those little changes actually really, um, although they were already happening, they were increased, I think, at our campuses, and, and those little things are a good starting point for change. Excellent. Um, we had a customer service program which we purchased from the Noel Levitz Corporation and everybody within student affairs participated in that and it was very behavioral just like you talked about. It's you not just simply sending someone over. You know I talked about earlier about how I worked with the distraught student. Um, it, I thought about whether we needed to walk over to the counseling center but by the time we got to the end of the half an hour it seemed like the issue had been resolved partially 
and the student had displayed some behavioral changes or I would have just simply would have walked them the what 300 yards from my office over to counseling services where we have emergency walk-in service so you're right on top of that I know one college up here, a uh, community college, is called Century College, and the way that they were able to agitate for change was that they had a very clear data study showing on how bad the student retention rates were. They looked at the breakout by demographics, by gender, racial, and uh, economic group. They were also able to show a comparison between their performance with other community colleges in the state and then also those nationally. And the data was enough to shock them enough that they were open to some pretty significant changes. We'll show you a website to go check out to learn about a program that they created in order to meet needs. Um, you're exactly right, evidence-based service successes at other schools. We have a comment in Austin. Yeah, I, I actually had some conversation late, but um, I am the department's faculty coach, which is assisting me with that DNA succeed, and my job is to share data, in my case, it's like developmental aid, it's like the developmental aid faculty, and then we make decisions on how to use that data. Uh, and we, in that first question, have a very in-depth Discussions, which is a way that some of it surprised us and assisted some of the things that have happened. Hmm. Uh, we talked about what can we do to change those numbers. Um, and, you know, you know, a lot of times we might blame someone else as the students, it's the counselors, it's the this, it's the push department when they get there. Um, and what we really got down to is we can't change anybody except ourselves. Right. And if we change ourselves, it's going to make an impact that for us. Hmm. Excellent. I, I appreciate that. Another thing I think is, is real important is that um, we're dealing with faculty members, we're dealing with counselors, advisors, uh, disability services, specialists. All of those people are involved in if we don't work together as a joint group, if no one can tell the other one, the other group, what to do. And so the input basically has to come in from everyone and work together, including the administrators. Uh, the support needs to come from the top. It, it can't just be the bottom level. It needs to come from the top and get input from, from all areas. Working together at the same time, not separately, but together. Hmm. You got to speak up louder. Okay. Uh, I know one of the things we're doing at Riverside, we meet at Townsburg uh, weekly, and we have begun a, a real search for data on what's happening on our campus, how are our students doing, uh, their retention, dropout, all kinds of information. And again, what we have found, I think Noel Levitz talks about this in terms of uh, creating an environment uh, which is focused <coughs> on student satisfaction. What can we do? What are the strategies and steps we can do together as counselors in collaboration with our faculty to create an environment in which the students feel safe, satisfied, because we found that that was one of the highest things that pertains to students, student satisfaction in the whole school environment. And so we're trying to do everything to have discussions about how can we make our campus cleaner and more beautiful? How can we uh, collaborate with our faculty and our gateway courses, gateway psychology, and our developmental courses, so that we can collaborate with them because we're finding out that the students are dropping off by the third week, the fourth hmm. week. So we want to get in there before then to provide some support, to provide additional information, to be there. And I think the other thing that I want to talk about is consistency, to be consistent in our work, with the faculty member and the student, we have found that many faculty members are 
really open to the idea of allowing us to work together and move this forward. Well, excellent. You've you've already kind of reached the, one of the issues, which was how do you have a climate for change? And obviously, you have one. Um, uh, it's what Arne Duncan hopes, you know, that public schools do is that to use data. And I know he's very controversial, so I'm not trying to politicize all this. But I think he has a good point is data-driven change is really the only way the change will occur. Because it not only shows you what the present condition is, but also, as you pointed out, what's changing now. I mean, um, and the numbers don't lie. I mean, about in terms of students dropping out and student satisfaction. My last institution, we used the Noel Levitt Student Satisfaction Inventory. Not here to push a product. I'm sure there's lots of other things that are out there, but it was pretty shocking whenever we started looking at the student satisfaction, and I think that can be an agitation. What this president did at Century College was he had repeated meetings with faculty in small groups where he shared the data. So rather than do one big um, session where he brought everyone into the amphitheater, he went out and did it academic department by academic department or service unit within student services and then had a conversation. You talked about the issue about are the head administrators online. Well, here you've got the president who actually is carrying this rather than designating someone to be the student retention person. It's actually about student success because we don't want to retain students. We want students to be successful. Retaining sounds like we're holding them against their will. And I think that that's, you know, if you see that I've used that term, then I apologize. I should have used the uh, more progressive term of student success. Well, excellent. Let's go and go back to um, look at a couple more things here. Um, we hadn't really designated when we were done for the day. Um, I think that we very well may be done-ish by 2.30. Um, I'm going to click by a couple of slides here because I want to get us to the session about universal learning design and how it has an impact with counseling and, and advising, and then I'd like to hear what things that you are doing um, as well. Some of these are all things that once again come out of the Hunter Boylan book, so I'm going to kind of click by some of these here because I think that some of this is good information, but I'm not sure it's com completely applicable for our audience here, which is primarily advisors and counselors. So once again, please go to the handout in order to uh, see some of the uh, some of this material. Um, and I just ask your forbearance. I'd rather put a slide in and skip over it rather than not put it in at all. I'm not sure if that's just annoying. Um, maybe it is. My apology. Sounds like you've got evaluation that's going on and also strong institutional support. There was a whole cluster of those in terms of uh, this. You talked about uh, campus-wide responsibility is what I heard one of you talking about. That's what Noel Levitz would say is don't have a um, student retention director for the campus. You may need someone to help coordinate, but it's everybody's business. Well, what have we learned thus far? This is kind of a summary for all those practices. Well, you need to be comprehensive. Um, there's really no best place to put developmental ed type activities because they operate in different places. Certification is key. Lots of training is key. Oftentimes, disability services is bundled along with learning assistance. Lots of different names for the programs. Um, serving upperclassmen, graduate, and professional school students. A lot of times, you know, uh, learning centers kind of focus on the freshmen, and people forget about the upperclassmen and the graduate and the professional students. And then, obviously, continuous evaluation. This is where I wanted to get us at. Universal design is about making buildings architecturally accessible to everyone. Universal learning design is talking about reducing barriers uh, for all students, not just for those who have a diagnosed visible or, invis or invisible disability. And as it says there, the accommodations that are provided for a few are oftentimes helpful for everyone. We can go spend a whole half hour looking at what all precisely the design features are for universal learning design. My recommendation would be, and let me hold on just a second here, I want to take you to show you something, and we'll come right back. 
and that is in term up here of these file uh, shares I'll make sure we come back a couple more times all you need to do is I believe on your end is to click on something and then save to my computer and I would recommend that you download all three of these publications here because everything I'm going to be talking about for probably probably most of the rest of our time together all are found in much more detail. The great thing about this is that this PASSIT project was a federally funded project by the government for uh, taking disability services and embedding it throughout the institution, taking it and broadening it. And these uh, volumes here are not just based on what we did at Minnesota, as good as that might be. They were built on examples from two-year, four-year, medium, small, large, public-private institutions from across America. So I highly recommend that for you. Here we are. So these are the kinds of design features you think about. I think that probably we're going to be looking at respectful and welcoming learning environment as we talk about how you could end up implementing this within advising and counseling. And these examples here come from two articles that come out of that PASSIT book. One's by the University of Georgia where they looked at universal design with counseling programs. And then at the University of Minnesota, their examples were how did they incorporate that into their academic advising programs. Um, so basically they kind of fall down into kind of these five categories here. And once again, please understand you probably do all of these things. I'd like to hear what additional things that you do in addition to what these folks are already up to. Physical accessibility, how do you create the welcoming environment, and then the other item. So let's get into some examples here. One of them that no doubt you already follow or something that would be a, an advanced version of it would be developmental academic advising. I'm not advocating that for you. I already make the assumption you already do that. But that's something that's real important to us here. And we actually go through, the advisors have a copy of um, Ender Winston's and Miller's book. You know, it's such a powerful book in terms of a different approach for advising. It's about the holistic approach. And that's how come we think that uh, universal learning design applies to um, uh, counseling and advising is that because it needs to be from a holistic point of view. I think maybe there's something that the PASSIT model which Gene Higby and other scholars here and other places kind of bring a little different twist to it and that is that we have a more inclusive definition of diversity. Now you may share it too so I'm not saying this is unique but at least this is what we thought was kind of unique about our approach. We also have a bundling of academic advising and disability support working together. Um, we have yet to physically co-locate our offices, but that's what we're working on because we believe that that is the better model. And also trying to be able to create a place where students feel safe to disclose to their academic advisors their disability issues. I know that's a very sensitive issue and we uh, want the disability office to be very careful and clear about helping students to self-advocate for themselves. Uh, but realize that they may not choose to uh, advocate or disclose. I mean, on my campus, I have students who won't disclose that. I also have students on campus that won't disclose that they're student athletes because there's a perception that they're going to be discriminated against. So these are things that we do. All of our materials are provided in alternative formats, so the things are available in Braille as well as in audio form as well as in print form. We try to make a point to be much more verbal when we're having discussions with students, particularly if there's any visuals inside of the materials. I actually do that inside my own class. I'll explain that later. We're working to try to eliminate multiple signatures for uh, forms that typically everyone's going to sign off on. The reason we think that that is a design issue because it just simply makes students go through more hoops. They have to go to more places on campus. It takes them more time. And then you layer on top of that, if they also happen to have some physical mobility issues, we've just made things harder. Same thing also with we're working hard to try to end duplicative uh, doc documentation. If people have stuff entered into computers with passwords, then we try to make sure we don't make them have to go re-enter that into additional databases simply because why do we need to keep adding those things as additional layers. Another item which we don't do inside of our unit but some of our units on campus are doing is that they're now offering Skype and other online means to do academic advising appointments with students. I'm just curious here if I could stop for a moment. Is any of that happening at Austin? 
uh, in terms of uh, using uh, distance learning in order to reach students that have difficulty coming in because of work, family commitments, or just simply the geographic distance? Yeah, it's kind of emerging, and I'm not sure to what degree it's kind of controversial. Once again, my professional training is not as an advisor and a counselor, and some of you might find that abhorrent, and I would respect that. I'm just simply reporting that's what some are doing. Um, let me s scroll here. Oh, we had phone advice only. Okay. Uh, well, that's a major step because it used to be on our campus we didn't do anything for students who are distance learning. This whole issue about adding this additional channel in has only really happened in the last couple of years. I mean, I still come from a community college world where you have student services offices open until like 8 o'clock, two or three nights a week. As much as I understand, maybe the counseling is available at night and health services are available, but I don't think there's much of anything else available after about 5 o'clock around here. And we work at a pretty large place. The, our academic advisors oftentimes are, are working with students who are new immigrants. We have a real uh, large population of uh, Somalis, Hmong, and Tibetans that attend the university, as well as uh, students from other locations lots of East African students, uh, recent immigrants and such. So our advisors, and I can't tell you as much about how they do all of that, I just want to list it, and that is that they talk about cultural implications and they believe that they bring a, an additional cultural sensitivity in their conversations with the students then. Uh, for them, they talked about uh, a welcoming physical environment. Well, you know, it's, it's a given. Everyone's going to have physical accessibility. But also, this one obviously is an issue for those of us who have less resources and lots of people in little room. There is a drive for all of our sessions to be available behind uh, doors um, or with walls. Um, for some of our advisors, they don't have a private office. They're out there in kind of the bullpen areas or they're located inside uh, with the... Um, um, separator walls that they all have access within very close distance to an office with walls that go to the ceiling and with a door that closes. Uh, they also make a point to have lots of real positive kinds of images such and such. You can see that inside the articles. You can see the kinds of images here. Uh, one of the advisors was talking about, actually several of them talking about having different kinds of seating uh, furniture available for them. Some of you probably might say, I'd say, happy to have a room. Uh, but uh, these, these uh, advisors, advisors were able to get additional, additional space. space. Uh, one, of, one of them um, actually, um, actually has, has a, a sofa, uh, sofa, a straight back, back chair, chair, and, and another kind, kind of chair, chair that students that actually choose, choose where they want to sit at. Oh, oh. Sorry about Sorry that. Sounds distorted again. Let me go down. Go down. And and I've got my microphone, microphone control. control. Let me go ahead and, go and ahead push, and back, push up back up a high volume, volume and see if that, see helps, that again. helps again. So, so did the HBC, HBC campus, campus give me a feedback a whether that sounds a little bit better? better? Not yet. Hmm. Okay. Um, what else can I do? Let me go and turn Austin's uh, microphone off for a moment. So it looks like I'm the only one that's on at the moment. So does that seem to help any yet? Slightly better, much better. Okay. What I'll start doing is I will watch the uh, chat room, and if someone would like to speak at Austin or any of the rest of you, just put a message there, and I will turn your mic back on. They told me that you're supposed to have multiple microphones on, but, you know, something's happening. I was really kind of intrigued about this issue about uh, the choice of giving students seating. Uh, they also inside of these rooms have a choice either between low level incandescent or uh, overhead fluorescent. And also they have talked about how they have their chairs on the little pneumatic thing so that they make sure that their eye level is equal with the student. Uh, one of them told a, a particularly compelling story on how this person was having interaction with a, a, a student. Uh, the advisor happened to be really tall. And um, 
the interactions weren't going all that uh, well and then one time they were doing another visit and the advisor's chair was broken and the little pneumatic thing blew out and his chair was really low and since he was tall he was now on equal eye level and the session went better and he asked the student about that because he thought he noticed that and the student said yes I really don't like looking up at people whenever I'm involved in an academic advising session and Therefore, as a policy, they now make sure that all their chairs are adjustable and they make sure that whenever they sit down that they readjust it to make sure they're perfectly at eye level with the student. So, interesting choice. Um, let's stop here for a moment. Let me go ahead and go over here to the chat room. Please tell me, let me go ahead and clean out our chat. And if Austin would like to talk, put us the message up. What are some things that you have done to make your counseling and advising services more accessible to students? I gave you some of our simple ones here. No doubt you do those plus many more. So could you share, please? Or if you don't have anything additional to that, then that will be okay too. But I just want to make sure I don't just keep moving along and I don't give you guys a chance to share as well. I will do so. individual offices uh, and we've been very conscious of this eye to eye contact and our as counselors particularly we're trained in that arena but what we do globally is we provide a minimum of two evenings a week for the offices we open at 30 we do have Saturday uh, at various campuses Saturdays open from 9 to 1 and, and uh, uh, we do allow of course a walk in System session, but the students can also make appointments with us. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a lot of different levels at where we can address uh, student need. We have another comment. Something that I've noticed over the years, and I've been at ACC too, but it's only 31 years. <laughs> but as we, of course, go to less duplicity, less use paper, we merge that over onto the, um, onto the computer. And so most all of our records and our interactions, are, well I shouldn't say interactions, but our records are on computer. And what I'm finding is that it's becoming more and more difficult to keep that eye contact with the student because you can't keep the eye contact with the student to truly do counseling or advising and still be looking at, at the computer mm -hmm. and entering data when you go when you have to go from system to system it, it is a contradiction of terms almost I'm, I'm hearing you about that and that's, there's a whole other issue and that is of um, accessibility for anything that's on the web too for students with disabilities. Hmm. Uh, I was going to mention again um, at my particular campus which is Riverside, uh, I don't know if Alicia mentioned this before but prior to my being at the campus, I guess, counselors and advisors were initially divided on sides of the uh, office. Um, so you had sort of a counseling suite that could be shut off from an advising suite. And uh, we had a dean in about five years ago who decided to sort of mix that all up. And she wanted counselors and advisors in all sections of the office. 
so that when students visited, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to the counseling section versus the advising section, so that people feel like there might be a stigma attached to that, or they're clearly seeing a counselor for something, you know, crisis-related versus I'm supposed to be an academic advisor. And then I know for myself, in just my personal space, I strive to make my office feel as much like a room in my home as far as lighting is concerned. I brought in, like, four different lamps. I don't use the overhead lighting in the office. It's stark. It makes me feel gross when I sit there with that lighting on. So pictures everywhere, pillows. I just want people to come in and sit down and automatically feel that. And I've noticed that since I've been bringing those items into my office, I get more and more comments about, oh, this is nice, or, oh, this is different from the waiting room, or, you know, I like your birds on the wall or whatever. So it kind of just opens up that conversation flow immediately. Excellent. I would add with Sonia, we are really striving at our campus, Riverside, to make the environment more welcoming. We've been talking about ideas of how can we make it better in our office area, from the point the student walks through the door, having our front-line staff, there's a counter. We've been thinking about things like plants and how can we make the lighting better. I know each of us has our personal styles in our private offices, but it's wonderful to see that. And I like the lighting to be subdued. I sometimes spray nice spray so it's fresh and smelling. And so everything from the site to the sense. So that when the student walks in, they feel comfortable. We want that to happen, quite frankly, everywhere in our building. And it's a hard task, but we're trying hard to get that to evolve with our administration. David, I don't know if you realize that we have, uh, of course, you know we have over 45,000 students, but we have eight separate campuses. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. No, I figured that probably there would be branch campuses, but I wasn't aware there would be eight. My. Yeah, eight individuals, and then we have a couple other different learning centers in other little cities, and we're in the process of building two brand new campuses as well, sir. Wow. Very exciting. Also, hopefully you're getting an opportunity with the new buildings to help shape those environments, too. Well, it's ironic you would say that. that the newer campuses, uh, they're a lot more conscious of the flow and, and the placement of the Office of uh, Students with Disabilities. Um, it's, what's, what's pretty ironic on our campus at Round Rock, you really... You know, students don't feel ostracized when they go to uh, disability services because they're, they're not in a, a separate location, so they're pretty much incorporated into the flow of the traffic. Hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you. What I'd like to do now at this point is I want to give you some examples of how I've incorporated uh, learn, uh, universal learning design inside of a classroom. And I realize this won't be as applicable for everyone, but I also want to give you a flavor for what it looks like to do it inside of a class. Because um, I think that there may be one or two faculty. I realize most of you are counselors and advisors, but if you'll forbear with me, maybe there's a couple of things that we'll notice here that maybe we can encourage some of our fellow faculty colleagues to consider too. And simply just drawing us back to, um, I'm just looking back at our list of our files up here. Um, I did not put for download our, our um, general college book. What I'll do is that I will um, send some web links to uh, Mervyn and to Tim and he'll make those available for some other downloadable materials. You can kind of find it through the Google but it sure would be a lot nicer if we had some easy to find web links. So I'm going to go ahead and shift back to the other screen. Okay, let me go ahead and give you a few examples of how we've incorporated this into our courses. In an anthropology course, uh, for us, um, 
the major thing that uh, he does inside of his class is he makes a real point about talking about students to come up and ask him for accommodations. Now I realize we've been talking about make the accommodation available for everyone in the class. But the reason why I threw this one in is that just simply at the most basic level, rather than just simply placing inside your syllabus that you are going to follow the law and make accommodations that are uh, required, uh, he talks about how he wants to encourage people to come up and talk with him and to self-disclose any disabilities in which he might be able to adapt class assignments or the environment to be more conducive for them. So it's just a really simple thing in terms of uh, what he does. In the general psychology class, they give two different pedagogies on how they can be able to complete a course. Uh, for them, they have the basic um, uh, approach of either self-paced instruction or you can go to the traditional lecture hall kind of an experience and we have found that a lot of students have made a preference to follow this more personalized and individualized approach. I guess this um, uh, Guy Keller actually was here at the University of Minnesota. They really kind of helped to pioneer part of this back in the 1950s or so. So as you can kind of see, it's kind of a different pedagogy here, and it's a giving students more choice in order to decide do they want the lecture experience or do they want the personalized experience. Same kind of thing is also available for our introductory mathematics courses that are taught within our department. Either you can do kind of the traditional method, which has support with student tutors, or it's a completely computer-based model, similar to the psychology class, and then the faculty member and academic tutors are available to support the students uh, in that process. In the anatomy course, they took one step further, and this actually was kind of novel about five years ago. It's not as novel today. They did audio uh, podcast recordings of all of the class lectures. And once again, nowadays, lots of classes are doing what you call, what, screencasting, where you're recording everything that appears on the screen. That's what we're doing actually with today. We're doing it two ways. One is we're doing everything that's on the screen that's going to turn it into a quick time movie, and I'll make that available to uh, Tim and Mervyn to share with people. And the other way is that this whole experience here is all going to be placed online and you'll be receiving a uh, web link that you can be able to consult it or share it with other friends. Well, about five, six years ago, this whole idea about recording was kind of unusual. We originally were doing this because some of our second language learners, particularly our Somali women, were having some difficulty keeping up with the complexity and the speed of the lectures. Maybe we should have chose to had some different pedagogies going on in the class, but whatever it is, that's the way that instructor taught. Well, so we originally thought, well, maybe just the students with language issues, quote unquote, would need it. Well, now what we found out is that everybody inside the class has it made available to them. In fact, we probably like you have probably participated in iTunes U where it's very accessible for students and uh, students say that they like to be able to listen to it a second time. Students who are riding the bus, standing at bus stops, uh, working out in the gym get a chance to listen to it again. So that was kind of the major item I wanted to focus on off of this slide. In our introductory writing courses, it's kind of more of a issue about universal learning design. It's probably much more about that second item up there. They intentionally integrate reflection on race, class, and culture inside of class discussions and the assignments because there's a high percentage of students of color, a high percentage of immigrant students, and a high percentage of students who are first generation and probably are economically disadvantaged. So they really tried to make that accentuated in the class that students feel comfortable about using these kinds of issues along with their class assignments for writing or for class discussions then. And student feedback is that they appreciate a safe place that they get to talk about an issue that also they receive academic credit for them. Um, also, and I don't know how that second to the last one works about how they accept various writing styles that are appropriate and effective, that's outside of my area, um, how they make sense out of that one, but what they were trying to communicate was that they want to make sure that students have an ability to communicate in a style that's appropriate for them and is acceptable. 
The last item down there is one that many of us have adopted, which is that we have extended time for people to be able to write and to complete assignments. We're not sure of what job you're going to have where you have to complete a 50-item a Scantron sheet of multiple choice questions and do that within 30 minutes. I hope someone's laughing somewhere about that. Um, so in terms of the writing assignments, they actually allow students to be able to take homework. They don't require them to do it all inside of class. What I do inside of my own history class is that I have two-hour class periods, and whenever it comes time for a major exam, I do my very best to scale the exam so that it takes most students just an hour and a half to complete. I don't see why I would want to make students come back for another 30 minutes of lecture after you've just done a major exam for an hour and a half, nor try to lecture to students for 30 minutes and then give them an exam. Either one of those two don't work. So I just simply don't pack as much into my exams. Now some students actually go ahead and take the full two hours, some of them much less. But part of what I'm trying to do is try to pull part of the anxiety out of the class experience because I want to know what they know rather than trying to push them. Um, can you also send your updated slides? Yes. Um, in fact, let's go and show you where those are at. Let's come back here. We'll be back in a second. hope this doesn't make you seasick. Um, it's right over here. This item up here, DE Overview, Austin Community College. Uh, handout is what the rest of the word would have said. And that is of every single slide that you're seeing or that we don't see today then. So that's where they all are. If for some reason you actually want the real live PowerPoint slides, then I could provide that for you. I just didn't want to send it because it's really just a big, great big slide, a great big uh, file. And thank you for asking. Um, so let me Common features of them, well, different modalities of learning, different ways that you assess people, kind of put academic development and support in the middle of the classes, and then you see the other items up here as well. So it's from the, U, from the University of Minnesota model. When I talk about the U, Minnesota model, that's really our academic department. If you know anything about general college, that's kind of the old general college approach. Not everyone at the university does, and we also don't claim to be the only place that does this, for heaven's sake. But at least it's kind of a core concept for us. Um, okay. I think this one would be a good spot for us and then we'll get in and I'll show for a couple of minutes about how I make adaptions inside my class. But one of the questions comes up is how can we go and take some really kind of common student development activities and think about them in a different way? What can we do in order to make things more accessible for students? And probably one of the most common of all the things we ever do on any campus is the campus tour. You know, lots of real positive things happen out of that. I guess I'd like for you to discuss there in your group, or if you're individually, what's the point of the campus tour? Is there some other way that you can gain the information other than the physical trip? And how could you make the tour more re-engineered to meet the needs of all students? You know, we're kind of talking about what to do with how to make um, advising and counseling more accessible. We're going to talk about instruction in a moment, but. Let's take about two minutes here to think about how can you think about the tour and no doubt at Austin you probably have already have done this so I'll look forward to hearing your story then. So let's go ahead and take two minutes please. Yeah. Awesome. We have something called ACC 101 which is a precursor to their orientation. Maybe like a mini online orientation that covers initial, critical, basic, introductory information for ACC, and then also assesses um, what students are coming in. And we give them basic student service information through that portal as well. And then it's reiterated at the orientation, uh, as well as uh, when they come in for their first services. Uh, advising session or counseling session, we go over uh, those services with them as well. And generally, I make it a practice to inquire or just make it known that if the student has um, 
uh, a learning disability or something they'd like to uh, discuss or mention to the service provider that we do have this along with them. Also, on that ACC 101, at the bottom, after you read it all, there's a checklist, a little box you can download to check off uh, questions you may have when you go visit your counselor advisor. So it's a good little handout for them to read that information and then think about it, bring it in, and we can ask them about that. There's another check, uh, box. Which is a resource, an ACC 101 resource list, which literally lists all of the resources of the college, admissions, financial aid, uh, uh, phone numbers, emails, everything. And I usually ask my students if they haven't done it already to download that to keep it in their notebook. And that's another thing we provide for new students uh, a little folder with all kinds of information. Come in, they can get folder, we get we tell them keep everything in your folder, your documents, and we come see you bring it in. Very nice. Well, obviously, there's ways that we can be able to deliver information, and I like the way that you prepare students to get even more out of their first physical appearance on campus. At least that's kind of the way I thought about what I heard you say. You added value to the campus appearance. I really like that. That's very good. I'm going to go ahead. Do you have something else you wanted to share? I was just going to gonna say, say that now, now our, uh, our orientation, orientation is, is, uh, is mandatory. mandatory. I mean, you, you have, have to go to either a, a physical uh, orientation or an online orientation. Is, you know, so, uh, so so students, students will definitely, will definitely get the information, information whether they want to get it or not. Hmm. <laughs> Oh, I think that's an enormous commitment for a campus of 45,000 to go to that level of commitment to that mandatory activity, just as when I talked with Tim about how you have a system for mandatory testing and placement, and I'm sure it's not perfect. No one has a perfect system, but that's an enormous commitment to make with a campus of your size. Well, excellent. I'm going to give a little bit of preview about some of the things that I do inside my own classroom. I'd like to be able to show you a website of a campus that is trying to integrate together the academic and the student service programs together in order to be able to meet needs of students. And is this something that you might want to explore to see if there's anything of utility for you? So I'm going to go ahead and turn off your mic just in case that, that causes any feedback problems. And we just share a little bit about my history class. Also, it's a few lessons I also learned from my um, departed colleague, uh, Professor David Gear, who was the other historian in the department. For us, we really work hard on making our information accessible for students, and that's in terms of making all of our readings also available online for students to be able to access those, and also following through on making them also PDFs accessible, because as I've more recently have learned that just because you place a flat PDF up online doesn't mean it's always accessible for students. We also end up making audio and video files from the class sessions available online and we make written transcripts upon um, validated requests. We don't do so for every student, but if Disability Services Office uh, notifies us, then we do so. But in terms of our class, we um, record all the class sessions, just like I'm doing here, and then I post that up within about six hours after the class is over with. We also provide all of the PowerPoint slides ahead of time for the students, both as a um, kind of like, uh, well not like what you have, it's actually in the more traditional three slides on the left, space to right on the right, but also students have requested that I go ahead and provide the actual PowerPoint slides themselves because now they have their own PowerPoint installed on their computers, their laptops, and they just go ahead and use the notes field in order to take their notes about the PowerPoint slides.
So I think that that is something I didn't anticipate. I also talk more verbally about visual images inside the class because A, it helps those who have sight impairments, but B, it actually causes me to make sure that all of us understand what was particularly significant about the image. And also, I use PowerPoint rather than writing on a screen because I don't know about other people, but you put me much more than about 30 feet away from a um, uh, white marker board and I can't read it. Maybe you guys are better than me. Um, I do have a few vision issues from some laser surgery on my eyes and such, but I wonder how many other students out there can't read anything that the professors are marking on the marker boards. And by the way, I made it my mission in life to see if I could find fat markers at any of the office depots around the world, and I have yet to find them. I think there's a great product out there. I make a point to use more uh, graphic organizers and mind maps and such for students because they express that um, they don't want to just simply be stenographers in class. They'd like to be able to see relationships. I do keep some interactivity, act, act, interactivity going on within the class. Um, I also uh, tend to work in classrooms where I work with a microphone. Research has demonstrated that even raising the human voice by 10 decibels, which isn't very much, improves the retention and learning of information inside of a class. Um, I know that uh, most instructors just raise their voice. I'm not real happy with my voice whenever it gets that loud. Um, it strains. It doesn't sound very good. So anyway, so I make a point to be in classrooms where we amplify the sound. And also, I provide online tutorials so my students know how to be able to use all the technology and how to complete assignments in the class. I've got classes of 75, so I'm happy to meet with people individually, but I find out that I need to provide more support for them. I don't believe in such thing as the millennial student. can't say it, much less whether believe in it. Students don't have innate ability to know technology. They're smart, uh, but they need to have some TLC too. I have different modalities of learning. I won't read through all the slide, but that's all the different kinds of things we do during class. Uh, students report that even if you're a good storyteller, they don't like that. They need interactivity, and you can kind of see. This is one of the questions I ask my students when they come in for those 10-minute interviews. What do you like? What do you don't like? What would you like to have more of? What would you like to have less of? And we talk about this mix-up here. How do I prepare the learners uh, for class? How do I get them prepared for it? Once again, I've sent out the PowerPoint slides ahead of time. I've also posted all the assigned readings all ahead of time. They already know they're going to be quizzed, so I require students to read ahead. Lots of people do that. I also let them know what the potential um, essay questions are ahead of time. There's a whole bunch of those inside of the pool. I don't think that it's necessary always to have exams that surprise people. I think it should test what it is that they do know. So for me, I try to make a point to let them know in general what are going to be the expectations, as it says down there, also the 10-minute interview as well. I think probably the most important thing to share out of this one here is that, uh, that I actually have uh, my students complete a survey after their first exam in which they identify 20 things that they did or did not do before the exam and during the exam. And then the only thing I ask them to do at the very bottom of the sheet is identify, did you get an A or a B, or did you get a C or below? And my teaching assistant helps me out. We tabulate all of that, and we come back to the next available class period and report back out to the students what were the behaviors by the A, B students. So rather than me, who's as old as Methuselah, telling them what to do, which they wouldn't do anyway, because they need a context for themselves. You know, my experience is not their experience but they really respond very positively to that because they're hearing what did other people do. You can kind of see some of the other kinds of things that I do here. We actually have a co-constructed exam study guide review. Um, you'll notice, um, let me flip back over to here, to the web links here. Uh, we actually co-create a wiki web page for preparing for the examinations. So actually I have students in the classes, one of their assignments, they're assigned to define glossary words, they are assigned to write up uh, detailed outlines for the potential essay questions, and those all get posted up to a website. Why do I do that? Well, because I know some students, or many students, are forming study groups, but some don't. 
either for cultural reasons, geographic isolation, they don't have time because they got to run off to class, they haven't got time to sit around at the coffee shop. So I want to make sure everything is accessible in the class, including group knowledge. Another thing is that we also create a weekly podcast in which I talk about essay questions, students talk about how they're thinking about the unit, and actually I even have a little bit of fun in it where it's actually some students end up getting some music and they incorporate that in. It's from a legal uh, site that you can get that. And we put that all together and this is now my 10th uh, semester of doing so. Uh, and we have found that there's been a real positive reaction to that. Students like taking things in via media. They also enjoy the opportunity to see what other students are thinking about the exam questions. I tell them very specifically that um, this is not a perfect answer. This is a answer. It is a sample answer, but it helps students who don't even know how to get started to start thinking about it then. And once again, students also have the opportunity to uh, look at lectures again. And I've been quite surprised the number of students, even in the A and B category, who will rewatch re portions of the class lectures. I don't know if that's a comment on me that I'm talking too fast or that I didn't do a very good job the first time. I mean, I've got to always take responsibility that there's another reason. Students tell me they just simply find that it's useful to hear it a second time. Um, once again, if you're interested in this uh, podcast, then you just simply need to go to this website up here, thenandnow.org. Oh, well, I guess it would help if I used a pointer. Sorry about that. There we go. I think it just now appeared. Um, so if you end up going to that site here, and this, is, this should be inside of your uh, handout, um, then you can actually click on a link and listen to previous episodes. Or, if you want to subscribe to this free podcast, it'll automatically be downloaded to your iTunes account, and you'll find it underneath the podcasting tab. And if all that sounds like a whole bunch of gobbledygook, then you just simply need to ask somebody who's younger than you are, and they'll give you a free tutorial. You know, I oftentimes tell um, and share with instructors that you can either read all the manuals, you can call me on the telephone, or you can look twice as cool to your grandkids and ask them. They will think it is so cool that you ask for help. And I ask my students for help all the time. In fact, the way I learned all this stuff is that I asked my freshmen to help me. And we would get together on Saturday mornings and we would train one another how to be able to do these things. And life goes a lot quicker whenever we ask for help. And once again, if you want to see this, um, actually I create this through Google websites. And if you go to myworldhistory.org, you'll see the uh, website that the students create on their own in order to help review. So I do keep an eye on it. If there is a inaccurate information, I actually do change it. Uh, but for the most part, I don't have to do very much with it. Students take this uh, assignment really serious, and they do really a good job. So what's inside of it? I talk about essay questions. Um, the, um, one of the students in the class gives an overview. Uh, and one of the students in the class actually will program some music in. And then upon need, uh, we provide transcripts. We have yet to do so yet. Uh, but that is available. Actually, I use um, uh, Dragon Speak as my uh, GRA, G-O-N Speak as my um, a voice to text translator and actually you've got a function now to where it's just drag and drop and it'll actually translate probably 75 to 85 percent correctly and then you just have to go in and clean up the other 10 percent. I'm going to skip by this slide because of time reasons. We actually can get podcasts from other people that I'm able to share with students. You do need to go ask permission from them. Uh, but there's other content that's out there on the net that can be brought in. Um, anything from history podcasts, I incorporate some of those into my class, as well as using Khan Academy, which is probably one of the most widely used of all the resources on YouTube. As I said up here, we co-construct our exam study guide together. Uh, they do the unit summary, they do the glossary of the keywords, and then also they uh, do detailed outlines of the potential essay questions. Um, another element, I think, of universal learning design is that, well, there's different ways to show that you learn something. So on my exams, they are a combination of matching vocabulary, multiple choice questions, and writing essays. 
It's what goes on inside the class. Low stakes papers. That's the Histropedia paper. Just think of them as little small papers of one to three pages. Actually, there's another interesting one. There's a free software package online. It's called Animoto.com, and it actually allows you to be able to make music videos. And that's another activity that some students really enjoy inside the class is that it's another way for them to express their competency that they're learning something and an ability for them to be able to share. And as I said, extended time is provided for everybody inside the class. So what happens if you have an officially documented student with extended time? Well, then they get more time. So my class is two hours long, and usually the uh, Disability Services Office will ask for time and a half. I think I've had a request one time, um, or directive, however you look at it, for two hours, for 200% time. Um, usually whenever that occurs we generally send them over to take the exam in the uh, DSO's office rather than with me but oftentimes I end up doing that myself. Um, once again that's inside of the notes my recommendation is to go and and just simply experiment and take a look at it. What are the outcomes out of all this stuff? Well you know I think that students um, tend to be more successful I think the institution benefits because we don't have to have as many individualized accommodations because we just simply provide it for everyone and more people find success out of that. So we think that that's really kind of what the key is for us. We can't offer developmental level courses here and we have pretty stringent requirements in order to get into the University of Minnesota. Um, at least accordingly according to ACTs and graduation percentile ranks and the rest you know if, if for all of the usefulness that they are but we still get students inside this institution that still have needs I mean I'm no mathematician but as much as I know you always have a bottom 10 percent or 20 percent or a bottom 50 percent no matter how many numbers you have you always have a bottom or a less prepared or whatever less pejorative term you want to use and I know that this is really what the future is, I think, for developmental education, is that we build it into the classes. And it turns out it's good for many people. Um, the last thing that I'd like to do, and then I'm available to do question and answer for the next 30 minutes. I'd like to do one more thing with you all before people start to depart, if I could, please. And let me take you over to here. One of the community colleges I talked about earlier was Century College. And here is the uh, web link. If you click on this, this will open up a pop-up window. And you can do that now if you like. I believe that I can demonstrate this on all of the screens. This is where I get a little nervous on this um, system here. Um, but if you end up clicking on that link right here, at least I think uh, it's highlighted. Maybe only I see it but it says GPS Life Plan website. If you click on that, that'll open up a web portal. The thing that is really important to understand is that this GPS Life Plan is not just a website. It is a philosophy of life at Century College. They centralize and coordinate and organize all of their uh, instructional uh, applications of career and personal development inside of their class sessions with actual curricular outlines. They end up bringing together all the workshops that are disparate throughout the campus. They all are integrated through this. What they try to do inside of GPS Life Plan is to provide a common language for everybody on campus, student affairs, academic affairs, whether you be an administrator, in order to talk about what is student success, what are the key ingredients of student success? Now you may end up looking at all of this and go, well, that's not the way I would define success. These may not be the five most important areas that I think are significant. What I want to do is I want to show you two slides, and then I'm going to take you to the website. And then people can make a choice whether they want to depart. I'm more than happy to stick around for a while. Sorry, I hope that doesn't make anyone seasick. Here we go. So it's gpslifeplan.org. What it is is it's looking at there's five different dimensions that students need to develop in order to be successful. Career education, finance, leadership, and personal plan. So that's kind of like the five objectives. The way that we end up experiencing that at Century College and now they actually have they actually give this away for free. 
You're not going to believe this once you see this website. Um, it's all developed by other money, and they're saying that they ought to be able to give it away. And actually, the state of Ohio just licensed all of this for every one of their institutions to use. Um, the major components is there's a web portal, a lot of interactivity inside of it. They also have incorporated with this an electronic portfolio. Maybe you've got something like that operating with Austin. It really kind of provides a way, as it says there, to capture, organize, and manage information. It's more than creating an online uh, resume. That's, it's, that's one part of it, but actually there's so many other thinking activities and actually built inside of it are questions. So actually you can choose to access this portfolio by answering questions rather than filling in blanks. It's really remarkable. The faculty end up integrating curriculum with these GPS 5 plan areas. They also have a campus-wide student success day in the fall and in the spring where they actually have no class except for workshops throughout the day. They also have workshops just like anyone else would have. The counselors, they end up using this as a resource and also as an accountability system, particularly by using the folio up there. So let me see where I'm at. Okay, if you want to read an evaluation of this um, system, then you can actually do so. Hold on. By up here underneath uh, File Share, the third item says GPS Life Plan Overview and Evaluation Report. Well, that is a report that I conducted. I was the outside evaluator for them. That's why I kind of know a lot about them. So you may want to download that particular document and I'll make sure that whenever we go to kind of question and answer I'm going to just set on this page because I think it's the only way that you can be able to click on these links and download documents. So now what I want to do is I want to go back to here to share and I want to okay let's see if we can do this correctly here I want to share my computer screen and I want to do display number two and what I need to do is I need to get us out of my email and I need to go over the GPS life plan dot org Okay, um, okay, ah, I am so sorry, um, I will fix that, um, my apology, I made a mistake. Um, if you want to, you could go up to the top of your pop-up screen and you could type in, rather than seeing the PAL notebook, my apology, is that if you would type into your pop-up window gpslifeplan.org and that would then take you to the page that um, would let you see this. But if you're looking at your screen right now, you should see, I hope, a GPS Life Plan. Can someone respond whether they see that or not? My apology to you, Sarah. Okay, it worked for us. But once again, apologies to you, Sarah. I just simply wanted to just simply just kind of get you to kind of take a look at this. And for goodness sakes, um, there's better people than I to help demonstrate all of this. But what you notice is that um, here's the five different topic areas. You can click on those and actually go to those um, um, portions to explore. What I want to do is I want to draw your attention down here at the bottom where it says students, faculty or staff or guest. And I'm going to click on the faculty or staff. Oh, good. And this is a resource for faculty and staff to go to to figure out, well, what am I going to do with this thing? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on Faculty Resources and Example Lesson Plan Database. I'm going to click there. 
And here, I'm trying to remember how many do they have. Oh, they've got tons of stuff down here. And this is actual stuff that faculty members have done inside their class in order to be able to integrate um, GPS Life Plan is not just some separate website, but actually it becomes curricular. So let's do Reduce Test Anxiety Lesson Plan. I have not a clue what we're going to see. What do we got? Okay, we're using the education plan. It explains what the assignment is. Um, this might be a study skills class. This very well also could have been a history class. Um, and it tells you who submitted it. And then you end up seeing here's the samples right down here. Um, I'm not going to click on those because I don't want to mess something up because we're too close to the finish line for me to blow this up. But what you see here is that here's the actual content. And my recommendation would be this is the place to explore. And I've got to believe we also have examples on how to use this in student development programs. I'm sorry I'm a little prejudiced. I only have been exploring the faculty side of it. So my apology. I should have done better about that. But part of what I'm trying to do at this point is kind of get you excited about the idea of using this as a model to take a look at the thing I find remarkable and once again you may already have your version of GPS life plan um, the thing is this is all free they'll give this away what they'll do is that they'll strip out of this any um, re reference to Century College or um, you know something about Minnesota and actually it allows you to be able to fill in your own content I know nobody probably believes me about this but they honestly gosh do this and if you're more interested in about that then contact me and then I can have you um, hook up with the people um, uh, that um, are in charge of this and they really love to share it like I said the whole state of Ohio adopted this uh, probably 25 colleges within Minnesota have adopted this. They now have created a high school version of this. They're getting ready to make a one just for military personnel who are abroad taking classes take this. And honest to gosh, they're actually making a version of this for prisoners. Isn't that interesting? I'm not quite sure what's going to be in the plan, and I'm, for God's sake, I'm not making fun either. Uh, my ex-girlfriend, she says her most significant experience on a weekly basis is working with prisoners who nobody ever talks to and tries to help them deal with anger and to take the next step. And maybe that's what they're thinking about doing for GPS life plan for prisoners is maybe we need to have a plan whenever we get out. I really am quite touched by it all myself. Um, so um, what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to take us back to the discussion chat page and um, I'm just going to make this open time now. Uh, thanks for your nice compliment. I'll pass that along. Um, this thing has moved a long way in the past five years. So um, here are your links up here. Um, I can't fix that one right now because I think one of you said that one of the links is messed up. I can't do that in the middle of the presentation or else I might blow the stuff up. But what I'd like to do is let's go ahead and kind of stop here. If people have questions um, please go ahead and uh, ask them here in the chat room. Um, and I just want to say, um, once again, I'm here for as long as we need to be, but I just want to thank all of you for participating in the workshop today. Thank you for being forbearing with me on some of the slip-ups here and such. And uh, it's always a privilege, so I hope I get a chance to be on your campus sometime. So I think I'll just stop at this point. And then as people have questions, uh, please do so. You might want to go over there to the file share and download the documents, take a look, and decide whether you want to keep them or delete them. But um, I'd recommend that you uh, take a look at those and see if there's some utility. So I'll stop, and I'll respond to questions at this point.